Now, Seed Library is a place where people can um, borrow seeds, they can donate seeds. It's pretty much like a book library, really. Library. Yeah, mm. same principle. Um, you can go into the book library and borrow a book, read it, and then take it back. So with the seeds, you can borrow the seeds, you plant them, you grow them, and because all of our seeds are for edibles, you can eat them as well. And then hopefully you'll be able to save some seeds at the end of the season and then donate them back to the library. So the library actually grows in size um, and everybody kind of has a, a good time along the way. Yeah. yeah. As, you, as you say, we've all got something to eat. Yeah. So the question is, why do we need seed libraries? Mm. Main reasons really are we're losing uh, diversity in our seed population year by year. Um, over the past century, we've lost hundreds and hundreds of different varieties of open pollinated seeds because they've been replaced by F1 hybrids. F1 hybrids, if you save the seeds, you're just not going to get the plant that you started with. Um, so we need to emphasise that we're saving open pollinated seeds. Um, we're also um, saving seeds because seeds do adapt to their local environment um, over the years. They, they get stronger and stronger because they adapt to the climate. And with climate change, it's something that we need to take into serious consideration. Mm, totally. But also, um, we're fighting agribusiness <laughs> um, who are systematically trying to patent seeds so that they're trying to make it illegal for people to sow the seeds. So we're up against two big battles here and the only way to fight it is to, for individuals to continue to save seeds mm. And, and maintain our diversity. Mm. Put the seeds into the hands of many rather than few, which is a key factor. Mm. And that's what can happen here because we've got, I don't know, about 180 odd members now, um, and everyone has the opportunity to save seeds, uh, and that makes it a huge, diverse resource of some incredible seeds that um, you might not even be able to get anywhere else as well which is a, a good thing. Well, so the thing is that seed catalogues used to be local seed catalogues. Mm. They weren't national or international seed catalogues. Um, and this is why we've lost a, local, a lot of local varieties because the seeds that are in catalogues now are growing in one area and there's no guarantee that the climate that they're grown in is going to be appropriate for the climate mm. you're going to plant them in. Mm. Um, so the loss of local seed catalogues means we've lost a whole range. I think we've lost hundreds and hundreds of varieties of, of cabbages, for example, and peas, which were local varieties that were adapted to our area. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite a worrying thing because a lot of the uh, seeds that are now in catalogues um, are basically um, bred specifically for commercial growers. Now, a lot of the people in our seed library are either uh, back garden seed savers or they might be small holders um, and some of these seeds don't work well for them it's like peas for instance isn't it when you might want an ongoing crop of peas which is really important because that same plant will keep cropping for you uh, whereas the commercial growers want them all to ripen all at the same time so they can take the crop off the field uh, and then that's it and their job is done with the peas whereas we want them going all the way through the year. So there's differences in needs here and we're trying to underpin that as well. And the other thing is that um, seeds that are saved on a small scale by small scale seed savers, the um, viability is far better mm. because the processing of seeds with large scale companies is quite brutal. The machinery that they use to process the seeds is quite brutal mm. and can cause a lot of damage to the seeds. So you might buy a packet of 10 seeds for your £2.99 um, and find that only three of them germinate mm. because they've been mistreated. Mm. Yeah, because it goes, as you say, it goes through quite a process really, but everything that's saved here, we've, generally the feedback we've had from library members is that the seeds germinate really well, like 
which is an amazing thing because they haven't been kind of handled too much. They've been saved by somebody, they've been brought into the library, they've been given to somebody. Uh, it makes a big difference. So, I mean, the uh, library really came about at our, one of our visioning days from the um, permaculture group here in Lampeter. And uh, there was an opportunity to put forward new ideas, wasn't there? Mm. Mm. And um, I stood up. I did wonder whether I should, but I did stand up and suggest how about having a seed library? And to my amazement, there was a lot of support for that. Mm -hmm. People really, really cottoned on to that idea. And um, we had an initial meeting. I seem to remember I was actually in this room doing it and worked out all the details of how mm -hmm. uh, we could actually start one um, and what we needed. So I think we, we, we knew we needed to dis design the library, mm. thinking along permaculture principles. We wanted to have things in place before we actually launched. So we took a, a, about a year. I think it was we? almost a year, um, yeah. yeah. Because we knew, I mean, for a start, we knew that we needed to get some more knowledge. Yeah. Um, some of us had been trying to save seeds, but we weren't really sure about how to go about doing that systematically. Mm. Um, and we wanted them to... Um, offer train, that kind of training to other people in the area as well so that we had a group of people ready to start thinking about how they might try to save seeds. Mm. Um, we're lucky here in Lampeter because we, we've got the Victoria Hall here as a place where we could sort of store a library because mm. um, we wanted to create a physical library. I mean, it's possible... Okay depending on where you are, <laughs> you can create a virtual library. Mm. It doesn't always have to be a sort of physical thing, but we had the chance to create a physical library here. Mm. Um, and we wanted to sort of have systems in place, didn't we, so that we could be clear about where the seeds had been saved and the conditions mm. that the plants had been grown in and could cre keep track of that. Mm. Um, and so that if there were particular problems with some seeds that came in, we'd have a way of sort of tracing those back and sort of sorting out what the problem might mm. have been. Or if people come into the library um, saying, I live up at a thousand feet, have you got anything that does well at a thousand feet? Yeah. We've got something that will sort of enable them to find out what in the library might work for them, mm. which has sort of worked. It, it has, it has. And I mean, it's, it's uh, actually widened people's um, knowledge, if you like, as to what they could potentially grow because they might not have thought they could do that and, and grow it outside mm. and needed a polytunnel. But there's, mm. a, there's a lot of things that uh, actually then prompted them to have a go. Mm. I thought yeah. that was really good. Because yeah. part of it is, is getting people to experiment as well, yeah. trying new things. Yeah, and, yeah. and having seeds that are locally adapted means that hopefully more people experiment and have success and then get hooked on growing, mm. growing food. Mm. And <laughs> saving seeds. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Because um, the whole idea is about building local food resilience and having as many people as possible growing food and, mm -hmm. and growing a whole range of food that does well here, mm -hmm. it, that may have been traditional crops, um, may have been things they've tried before, may, may be things from other parts of the world that are grown well in similar conditions mm -hmm. that also do well here. So it's really expanding the variety mm -hmm. of what food can be grown here. Yeah, definitely. Well, when we um, first started, we thought we'd better find out how to save seeds, didn't we? Mm. <laughs> but as you said, we've already uh, been doing it ourselves, but didn't feel we was um, that knowledgeable. No. No. We still had gaps, didn't we? Um, and part of that, we found um, uh, Sue Stickland, who's the author of Back Garden Seed Saving, and she's not very far away from us, was she? She was no. up in Newtown. So we was very lucky that we found her and she was willing to do a workshop for us up there. So the permaculture group very kindly funded um, a number of us going up there for a day's workshop with Sue to try and absorb all her knowledge. <laughs> Some of it. Some of it, anyway. <laughs> 
and um, be able to bring that back here to Lampeter to be able to then cascade that to other people because yeah. we then wanted to run our own workshop based on some of the simpler seed saving mm. methods to start with, something we felt confident in doing. Mm. So Sue wasn't just teaching us about seed saving, she was giving us tips and pointers mm. on how to run a seed save, an introductory seed saving workshop for other people. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So we, we did two of those, didn't we? Introductory mm. seed saving workshops. Which were really well attended. Mm. I mean they were there was such a buzz on the day of each mm. of those, wasn't there? Yeah. It was great. Yeah. Lots of people excited about the idea of saving seed. Yeah. And realising how simple some of it was. Mm. That, that was the thing, people not realising that actually just when you cut a tomato up that you can eat that tomato and then you save those bits in the middle and they're your seeds. Yeah. And it's really that simple and that, that was really an exciting thing I think for a lot of people, wasn't it? And doing the workshops really built our confidence mm. in our own knowledge and our familiarity with the technique, didn't it? Mm. Yeah. yeah, definitely. The more we did it, um, the more confident we became. Mm. Um, so now when we get questions, <laughs> if anybody asks, well, how do you do this? We feel a lot more confident. And if we haven't got that knowledge, we've got Sue's book yeah. as our reference. Uh, and we've got a couple of other books as well that we can call upon. So um, we don't pretend to know everything. And there are members of the library who've mm. got a lot of experience as well. And totally. we can draw on their knowledge, can't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we've got some very experienced growers that have uh, come on board as well. Yeah. yeah. So it's uh, it's it's great. Yeah. So those those workshops enabled, I suppose, enabled us to feel we had the knowledge to start the library, and that we had a, a sort of wider base of people who got the idea, um, and would also feel confident about trying to save seeds, so that we'd have some donations to go into the library in its first year mm. and we spent that first year busily saving seeds <laughs> ourselves didn't we yes um, we did yeah because um we did i think we got some donations from real seeds we certainly got a lot of donations of information real seeds mm. were really generous about sharing in saying that any of the information on their website mm. is open to anyone to mm. have so in the beginning we used quite a lot of that to hand out to people to the workshops didn't we mm, yeah um but in the end it was pretty much all stuff that had been grown around here that it went was. into the library in its yeah. infancy i mean sue gave us some donations mm. as well from uh some of her saved seeds mm. which um you know are not that million miles away from here 50 miles away so she gave us some to get us started on some of the varieties we didn't have, mm. which was very useful. Um, and then, of course, we all saved mm. as well, encouraged other people to bring in donations, and we was quite amazed by the response. Mm. Um, you know, the library drawers were quite full up, weren't mm. they? Which is really good. And speaking of the library drawers... <laughs> um, yeah, this was a set of second-hand index drawers that Transition Clambed actually bought for us to store the library in. Mm. Um, so that they were in effect donated to us. Um, the seed envelopes, um, this is part of what we decided we needed to have as part of our, our system of, of keeping the seeds and, and recording their provenance mm. um, and um, also knowing how long they would be viable for. Um, so Kathy designed um, a stamp that would go on um, a set, set of um, wage packet envelopes, those um, interesting historical items, um, <laughs> that record the type of seed, the variety, which seed library member it's been saved by, the year it was saved in, um, if possible something about the conditions that it was grown in um, and when people join the library they actually fill in a simple membership form that they, they give us information on about where they're growing mm -hmm. sort of things like the elevation and mm -hmm. the soil, soil type yeah. whether it's windy yeah. whether it's wet mm -hmm. mainly it's wet, wet. <laughs> and how exposed it is what aspect it is things like that that could inform people mm. when they're choosing whether it's grown inside as well whether it's in a polytunnel or, or outdoors, or outdoors yeah. yeah 
And then any sort of specific issues about sewing notes? I mean, if something's tricky to germinate, mm. something like that. Yeah, don't give um, up. <laughs> so the, the envelopes and the stamp were an initial um, sort of investment that we had to make. And the permaculture group, in addition to funding our training with Sue, Sue yeah. um, gave us some money towards these. Um, the training workshops that we offered to other people, um, we offered those on a returnable deposit um, basis on the um, idea that we wanted people to commit to coming but not feel that they had to pay anything if they couldn't. But if they then wanted to donate that deposit mm. to us, they were then free to at the end of the workshop. And a lot of the deposits were actually then donated mm. to the, the library. Yeah. Um, so that gave us some additional funds. Um, and we bought um, some sealable plastic boxes as well, just to make sure that the seeds are kept dry inside these drawers. Mm. Um, so all in all, it was about a hundred pounds um, to start up, something like that. I think there's probably a little bit more. If we if we think of um, Sue's training, mm. it's probably about 160 mm. all told. But I mean, that's not a lot of money really mm. for a day's training with somebody. Um, all the equipment, mm. um, and we kept everything quite low key, didn't we? Everything was just done on our, our computers at home. Um, the the uh, system of the library membership, mm. uh, we have forms rather than cards, mm. um, and they're just all kept in a folder. So it's a manual system. We don't mm. make anything too complicated. No. <laughs> low tech, low tech, uh, low tech. Yeah. <laughs> but of course. If anyone else wanted to do something that's a bit more high tech, particularly mm. if you were, um, I don't know, if you were in a situation where everyone was more dispersed and it worked e more easily to have, as it were, a virtual library, it might work to have a sort of virtual membership base and a virtual database mm. for seeds and things like that. Mm. It really depends on your, you know, your particular situation, mm. what you think is going to work. Yeah, I mean, there's you. there's some libraries, isn't there, that do um, postal. Mm. Like uh, on the Shetlands. In the Shetlands, that's right, because yeah. that was somebody we looked at their system, mm. Mm. Uh, how they were doing it. But there aren't that many libraries around. No. Um, not there's seed co ops, aren't there? There's seed co ops. There's mm. also um, community interest companies in London, there's a couple. Um, but um, there's, there's not that many that are mm. kind of organised like we are. Mm. I think the other benefit of having a physical place, I mean, mm. the library um, is, as it were, open twice a month at the local people's market in the Victoria mm. Hall. Um, and that's not just about people bringing in seeds or withdrawing seeds, it's a focus for people to come and have a talk about how they're getting on with growing stuff, problems mm. that they've had, mm. ask questions about germinating. Or it's, it's just a real mm. place to exchange information and build the excitement mm. and, and build the community of people who are interested in growing and saving mm. seeds. I mean, it, that's really, I think that's really helped the library to grow. Oh, goodness me, yes. I mean, every time the library is there, we sign up new members. Mm. Every single time it's open. Mm. And you think, that's pretty amazing. Mm. There's mm. always somebody new coming on board. Yeah. Um, and when you think we've been going now for what, two years and we've got, you know, getting on towards 200 members mm. and we're only in a small population town. Mm. And I think that's, uh, it obviously captures people's imagination as well, mm. I think. And part of the reason we're making this video is because it's captured people's imagination. imagination. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, rather than um, expand our carbon footprint yeah. by travelling to give talks, we thought this would be a good way of sharing, sharing it. Sharing it, mm. yeah. Mm. That's what we're about, isn't it? Mm. Sharing. What else have we been up to? Mm. Well, we've developed, we, we've tried to put on seed, uh, seed saving workshops each year, haven't we? So mm. that people who've joined the library newly can um, have some basic training if they want it. But we've also tried to develop the, the training in the workshops. So we've moved on from the, the easy to save seeds like peas and beans and tomatoes to give people a bit more information about the 
the harder stuff like biennial crops like brassicas um, and uh, things like squashes that are a bit more tricky to isolate mm. and, and pollinate so they, they come true um, and we've been really lucky Sue Stickland has come back each year for one workshop where she's done some of the introductory stuff and then led a session on something a bit more in depth um, but then we always had the hands on mm. sorting yeah. seeds and um, processing them which everyone really enjoys mm. over the cake and tea <laughs> Um, and we've moved our workshops to Denmark Farm, which is a nearby conservation um, farm. So we're doing things more in um, collaboration with them. They've given us some space to um, create a seed garden there um, and some seed, sort of growing for seed areas, so that people have got a chance to see what plants look like when they carry on and their full life cycle and, and become seed heads because that seems to fit in nicely with the, the kind of things that Denmark Farm's about. I think people are very surprised when they actually see how big a plant will grow before it flowers and goes to seed. Things like chard and kale and things, how and big lettuce. they grow and lettuce. I think that people are a little bit surprised when they realise how big it grows. Mm. Mm. So we've done that. Um, we've we've been um, we've been working with the Gaia Foundation. Oh, yes, we? yeah. Um, Gaia Foundation Seed Sovereignty Program. Um, we've got links um, with our Seed Sovereignty Program. A because we are trying. Our aims are the same. They're working towards trying to encourage people to save or open pollinated seeds. They're looking more um, at people doing this on a commercial basis. Um, but they're also keen to encourage community schemes like ours and um, a more specific link with them is to do with um, saving cereal grains, um, local cereal grain seeds that um, have been grown in Wales in the past um, but have almost disappeared and it's a project trying to encourage the growing of more cereals, again, to do with food security, um, food, food sovereignty, um, and in encouraging more mixed farming in, in the area. Um, so we have got some grains that we are going to, in the future, try and bulk up to make more seed available um, to be grown on a more um, sustainable basis, basically. Because if you, you know, we've got several dozen members of the seed library each growing a small area of grain, that, that mounts up quite quickly, doesn't it? Does. It? it does. Mm. So that's an exciting venture that we're involved in at mm. the moment. Every and it's really exciting just learning about the history of some of these grains and, you know, the, where they've grown before and what they've been used for. And, and making contact with the farmers that are, are actually trying to grow some now commercially. Yes, yeah. yes. And, and, and looking at all the old machinery um, that is still in existence, that is being brought out of um, mothballs, mothballs <laughs> and uh, is going to be put to good use again in the future. So it is quite an exciting thing. And it's also an interesting, community-wise it's interesting, and, and part of it's basically part of Welsh culture um, that... Hopefully, we're going to have our small contribution into bringing these things back. So, what else have we been involved in? Um, well, we've we've sort of supported other local groups. I mean, we have um, an incredible edible group in Lancaster, which is about growing um, vegetable in and um, edible foods in public places for anyone to harvest and eat. I mean, we've generally provided the seeds for most of most of the sites in Lancaster. We took our talk to the Wales Incredible Edible Gathering, didn't we? We did. Um, that was good. And that seeded another library in Porth Maddock um, that's being run by Incredible Edible Incredible there. Edible there yeah. um, we've given various talks around Wales, haven't we? We have, um, we've tr which is one of the main reasons we're making this video, uh, because we've been travelling quite a distance to do talks um, because of people have learned about our seed library um, we 
We've been in, um, into Powys and um, we're in Flandre Dog Wells where they've now started the seed library. Um, we've done talks with in, at the um, Paramithi Cymru Land Workers Alliance Convergence. Uh, we did a workshop there which was really exciting because we've got people from all over Wales um, and that I think has sparked an awful lot of interest in other areas. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel really confident that that's made quite an impact. And various um, gardening groups um, and um, even had to do a talk in Aberystwyth recently with Aber Food Surplus, which is an organisation that uses so-called wet food waste to um, develop community initiatives for uh, community meals, etc. Um, and it would be a great place for them to have a seed library because they've got a premise that's open to the public all the time and it fits mm. in again with the food security idea of our initiative. Mm. So, if you're ready to start up your own seed library, if you really, really want to do this, all you need is a lot of enthusiasm. Um, you need to join uh, in with some sort of community group because it's pretty tough to do it on your own. Um, community groups can be anything ranging from gardening clubs, uh, allotment societies, schools, WI, anything. Just you need a group of enthusiastic people. Um, you don't need a lot of money. No. Um, it's amazing what people will share and donate mm. um, when they get caught with the excitement of a good idea. Mm. Um, it doesn't have to be complicated. Um, start small. Mm. It could be a shoebox mm. with some seeds in it. And it could be kept in a local shop. It could be in the actual library. It could be anywhere. It mm. depends what's available mm. to people. Or it could be at the end of an email and you post things out to people. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's a thousand ways of doing it. Mm. But if you want any more information about how we managed our seed library, how we started up and how we run it, um, we have an e-booklet that you can obtain by sending an email to our email address, which you will see on the screen. Bankhadislamband at outlook.com Thank you. <laughs> Success. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Andrea. And I'm Cathy. And I'm Julia. Jochuwali Shigi Am Grando Guinea. Thank you very much for listening to us. Mm. And good luck. Good luck. <laughs>